Welcome aboard Just Jets with your captain, Matt O'Leary. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hey, what's going on? Matt O'Leary here, back with episode number seven of Just Jets. I'm excited to be here. It is still free agency time. We're getting into that, and I just wanted to say wherever you are listening to this show or watching, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. New episodes are dropping every Monday, and I appreciate all the love and support, especially during this time, man. It's been weird without sports and being in isolation. I know everyone's isolated right now. Keep doing the social distancing. It's super, super important. This coronavirus right now, I I know you're probably coming here to escape but it would be crazy for me not to mention i just hope that everyone watching is safe right now and you know keep washing your hands and social distancing and we're gonna get through this together but just wanted to clear that up and and get that out there my my message anyway so pretty packed episode i have a ton of questions that i want to get to today so i'm gonna keep the intro segment kind of on the shorter side and really my main topic that i wanted to talk about today because free agency got really quiet so we found out that robbie anderson left i'm gonna talk about that i'm gonna talk about who they replaced robbie anderson with and do a little compare and contrast Ryan did that really well on his channel on Jets Talk 24-7. Definitely want to subscribe to him. We definitely do uh, a call-in show and just pretty much roundtable on Tuesday nights if you're interested. It's me, Grand Green David, and Green Bean over from Jets Nation. So definitely worth your while to check that. All their guys' content's out and stuff like that and uh, for that show for sure. But he really hit on that one a a lot. So I'm not going to go into crazy detail like he did. He did a phenomenal job, better job than I could do. So I'm just going to talk about my feelings on the deal. Robbie Anderson, we find out accepts a two year deal to play for his old coach at temple. And I can't say that I'm too surprised Matt rule. And it was an extra little thorn in the side because if you guys have been with the channel for a long time, you know how I feel about Matt rule. He was the guy that I wanted the New York jets to hire over Adam Gase um, I was between really Matt Rule or Cliff Kingsbury. They were my one-two punch for guys that I wanted to hire. And I was really disappointed because it looked like the New York Jets were about to hire Matt Rule. And then he decides, no, nah, I'm not going to come. I'm going to go back to Baylor. And good for him because he got a huge mega deal from Carolina. And then Robbie Anderson, who played for him on the, when he was the coach of Temple, he goes down to Carolina on a two-year deal. $20 million, so AAV is $10 million a year, but he's getting $12 million this year, 8 next year. I've made it abundantly clear that I would have given Robbie Anderson $12 million a year. I would have given him over a four-year period. I would have been comfortable going 4 for 48. I think the Jets should have done that, but they decided not to. Joe Douglas had a price point that he was willing to go up to. I, it appears like, I'm assuming it's going to be $10 million. I really am not buying... Boomer Esiason's rumor that he's putting out there that the Jets offered him a four-year deal, $40 million, because Robbie would have took $40 million. I mean, that that's crazy. If you're going to take $20 million over $40 million, that that's ridiculous. Robbie Anderson, if he was offered $40 million from the New York Jets, would have taken that. He put it out there in a tweet saying that it was false. It's 100% false. I don't buy for a second that Robbie Anderson was offered the same kind of contract that he got from the Carolina Panthers. So Robbie goes to Carolina, and what you are losing from Robbie is, obviously he's a deep threat, we know that. He has really good continuity with Sam Darnold, we know that. He's Sam's probably best target, and they have the most comfortability together. And you're losing someone who you found as an undrafted free agent in 2016 and got some fairly good use out of. In 2017, he had 950 yards-ish. And something that I've hit on in my videos in the past and why I think it would have been worthwhile to pay Robbie Anderson is in the three years in which he was productive and a starter in 17, 18, and 19, he didn't have a healthy quarterback for any of those three years. Each year, his quarterback missed three games. And I think he definitely goes over 1,000 yards in 2017. There's probably a good chance that he does it in 2018 with Sam Darnold. I don't know if he would have did it this year, but you're looking at probably a guy who would at minimum eclipse 800 yards 900 yards in that range and 
I know he's not your prototypical number one receiver. I'm not here to argue that. I just think that with his speed, continuity with Sam Darnold, it would have made a lot of sense to bring him back. They did not. He goes to Carolina, and in comes Brashad Perriman, who would have been my number two choice, but he definitely is. I want to make this clear. I think he is a step back from R.B. Anderson, especially because he hasn't done it at any consistent level so far in his career. So he was a first-round pick in 2015 with the Baltimore Ravens, gets hurt, misses the entire year, is banged up in 2016, really ineffective in 2017. He leaves 2018, a one-year deal. In Cleveland, he was okay in a small sample size. And then in 2019, he really only came on strong for the final five games. I understand that he was behind two really good receivers in Evans and Godwin, but he didn't really do all that much in the first uh, nine-ish games. In the final five, we understand that he put up big numbers, and I think he had six touchdowns in five games or somewhere along those lines. He had like 90% of his production in the final five games. So if you're getting that receiver that you had from weeks, what, 12 through 17, 13 through 17, whatever the sample size you want to look at, then this looks like a very good deal for the Jets who signed him on a one-year deal worth up to $8 million. But my fear is what version of this guy are you getting? You are taking on a pretty big risk with Perryman because you have no clue what he is. Now, he's one inch shorter at six foot two than Robbie, but he's about 25 pounds heavier. He ran a faster 40 time. Play speed, I think they're very similar. He, he's a similar player. I mean, it makes sense for why they went with Perryman after losing out on Robbie Anderson. My thing is, I would have rather bought, brought Anderson back than pay someone who is a little bit of a risk, for, even though it's less money. I think the Jets had the money in the bank in order to do that. They had the cap space in order to do it. They decided not to, so Perriman's the guy right now. It, it looks like it's going to be Perriman and Anunwa on the outside as of this second. And then you have uh, Jamison Crowder in the slot. I like Crowder in the slot. I think he's good. Anunwa, I'm a big fan of his game, but I don't know if he could stay healthy. So the receiving core is still in flux. You're definitely going to have to take one in one of the first two rounds, depending on what your plan is at that position. I think I'm still team offensive line in round one. If all the top four guys are gone and you're sitting there and Jerry Judy or CeeDee Lamb are there at 11 for the taking, it would be really, really hard for me not to take one of those two guys. But I don't see Joe Douglas taking a wide receiver in round one. Based on everything that I've heard so far about this guy, I don't see him taking a wide receiver in round one. I would be very surprised if he did. I'm not saying that's what I would do. I'm just saying based on what I know and have heard about Joe Douglas, I would be very surprised if he took a wide receiver. And as of right now, I would say the Jets receiving core looks worse than last year. Yes, they improved on the offensive line. Didn't really get any big-name guys, but their receiving core is not the same as what it was going to be heading into 2019 with Sam Darnold. Um, and ultimately here, you want to put your young quarterback in a chance to succeed. We're seeing Buffalo do that. I mean, I made a video the other day where I talked about Josh Allen versus Sam Darnold. And I truly believe that Sam Darnold is the better of the two quarterbacks from a prospect perspective and a pure thrower. I think Buffalo is doing a much better job of putting players around Josh Allen. We saw that with Lamar Jackson. They built an offense tailored to his game. Even with Baker Mayfield, I know he wasn't that great this past year, but they went out and got Odell Beckham Jr. They have Jarvis Landry. They have big-time targets that they can make life easier for their young quarterback. And the Jets seem to be doing Sam Darnold no favors, which is something that scares me a little bit when looking at the future of this team because Sam Darnold is the future. He is still extremely young. He's not 23 years old yet, and he has two years of starting experience in the NFL. That's huge, but you got to help him out. And I don't think what the Jets did this past week, letting Anderson go, bringing in Perryman and relying on Quincy Nunwa as of this second to be a starter is definitely risky. I don't know what you guys think, but for me, I, I am definitely a little bit concerned about the wide receiver position. It's something that the Jets are going to have to attack in the draft 100%, but ultimately here, it, it's not it's not a strength. And this past week, it didn't really help that. And really, you should be looking at ways to make life easier for Sam Darnold. All right, I'm going to get into the question now. I have a ton to get to. The first one comes from Twitter 
Actually, it's a special circumstances. And then I have a ton of voicemails to get through. That's why I really just wanted to focus more on the Robbie Anderson versus Perriman bandwagon, that that little story. Uh, again, I think that Anderson's the better of the two receivers. I don't necessarily think Perryman's a bad replacement. I just don't know if you could fully... Uh, expect him to produce at the same level as what Anderson did over a full season because he hasn't done it yet. The potential's there, but it's still a little bit sketchy. So the first one comes from James Swift on Twitter, and he says, if New England wanted to trade up for a quarterback like Love or Herbert, would you trade with them or not? If so, what would the compensation be? I would find it very difficult to trade with the New England Patriots in order to give them a quarterback. I don't think I would do it. I would definitely need a future first round pick in the deal. I'm going to need uh, your first round pick, obviously in a pick swap this year. They don't have a second because of the Mohamed Sanu trade. So I don't know if there's a package enticing enough for me to get them uh, to move up. And I don't want to help out Bill Belichick at all. I know that they just lost out on Tom Brady and everyone's happy about that. Myself included that it's that, that I is over, but if you don't think that Bill Belichick has a plan in place, you're crazy. Even if it's tanking this year and they end up with like Trevor Lawrence, and I don't think they're going to be bad enough to the point where they're tanking. I still think they're probably the second best team in this division. The Jets and Dolphins fighting for that three spot right after that. I I can't see the New York Jets. And if I was in charge of I'm Joe Douglas, I am not trading with the New England Patriots. I know they did over this past season with Demarius Thomas, but that's not trading for a potential franchise quarterback. I I don't see it happening. I understand the logic. Like, I'm not opposed to moving back. I just don't want to do business with the New England Patriots, and they would have to offer something crazy in order for me to consider it. Like, maybe two more additional first-round picks after, like, sw- you swap this year and then, like, two first-rounders after that. And I don't think they would do that for Herbert or Love. I think they are going to go a different direction. I would not be surprised if Stidham gets the shot this year. I don't think he's the guy, but I think I could see them riding him out and then trying to position themselves to move up in the draft to get somebody next year. Next question is from Steve. We're going to get into the voicemails now, and he wants to talk a little bit about Robbie Anderson. It's going to be a big topic of discussion today's show. Hey, Mr. Matt O'Leary, this is Green Blood Blitz, JetsNation.com. Wanted to just give my two cents on the uh, Robbie Anderson signing with the Panthers. Obviously, the connection with Matt Rule uh, is, you know, has something to do with it, but I would say... I don't understand how Teddy Bridgewater is going to be able to get the ball down the field. He's not a big arm quarterback, and obviously we know, you know, Robbie Anderson is, he's a guy that runs down the field. That's his routes, you know? Um, Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something that is a concern for Teddy Bridgewater and the Carolina Panthers. Robbie is a deep route guy, and I don't see Teddy as someone who really gets the ball downfield a ton, but... I do think Matt Rule and Joe Brady, who I like a lot from LSU, are going to scheme Robbie Anderson open. And then Robbie Robbie's fast. I think that the Jets got into a bad habit of essentially using him for two routes, a deep route and a down and comeback. I think they could do a lot more. Getting Robbie Anderson open over the middle using his speed, I think you're going to be able to see that a lot. Also, maybe you're not throwing the ball 40, 50 yards down the field to Anderson, but throwing him tw- the ball... 20, 25 yards down the field, because think about it. Teams are going to be so focused on Christian McCaffrey that they're going to want to move the safety up in the box. And then that's where Robbie Anderson can really expose you. And if Teddy can get the ball out there, I would not be surprised if Robbie Anderson's in a thousand yard receiver this year, at least 900 yards. I'm going to say for Robbie. And I think he really plays well in Carolina. He's with his old coach. We know that Matt rule got a ton out of him. I think it's a good situation for Robbie Anderson. It really sucks to see him leave. I'm a big Robbie Anderson guy. I get the concern from the Panthers' perspective of Teddy not being able to get the ball down the field to him, but I think they're going to have a really fun uh, offense. This next question comes from Dylan, and he wants to talk a little bit about uh, Ruggs and Robbie Anderson. Dylan... And I'm from New York. My quest, 
question. Well, I have multiple questions. Um, what do you think about if the Jets traded back and maybe got Henry Ruggs? And also, what do you think about Perryman? What do you think, like, you think he's better than Robbie? Or, like, do you think he's going to be a good fit for the Jets? Really good question, Dylan, and thank you so much for calling in. So, I like Henry Ruggs a lot. I would be interested in moving back and drafting him. Um, I would not take him at 11. I don't think he's worth the 11th overall pick, especially because I think C.D. Lamb or Jerry Judy, if not both, are going to be on the board at 11. But if the Jets moved back to the late teens, maybe early 20s, and Ruggs is there, I would take him I said it a little bit earlier on this show that I would be very surprised if they went wide receiver in round one, but I I like the idea here. And when you look at Robbie Anderson versus Perryman, they're pretty close. And I think that's why the question is completely fair. I I don't think he's going to be as productive as Robbie Anderson if I had to bet on it because injury history in years gone by. And also, he just hasn't gotten a chance to really be a full-time starter in this league. So you're taking the risk that he can be a number one receiver. And let's face it, I know what you're probably saying is, well, they could draft somebody and he'll be the number one receiver. But to expect a rookie to come in, most likely a round two player. Because if I had to bet, I'm thinking the Jets are taking the best tackle available at 11 and just going from there. So a round two receiver, even if it's someone who falls, like a, a Justin Jefferson, for like, pray to God he's there in the second round or a T Higgins or someone like that to expect them to come in and produce like a number one receiver right away is a bit much. It really is. So I think he's going to be good. If I had to bet or if I had to put a guess on the kind of production we see from uh, Perryman with the New York Jets. So I'm going to assume that he starts and is healthy for 16 games. I'm going to say about, 800 yards and five touchdowns. I think that's probably what you're looking at from Perriman, and I would expect probably a little bit more out of Robbie Anderson. I think he's going to be 900 to 1,000 yards and a little bit maybe like seven touchdowns for Robbie. I think Robbie's a better player, but I think when you talk about fit, I mean, it makes sense because Perriman essentially serves the same purpose as what Robbie Anderson does in an offense. He's just not as good as what Robbie is. Thank you so much again to Dylan. We're going to move on over to George from Georgia. And he, uh, he wants to talk about the safety position. This is a little bit of a longer question, but I, I like this one. Let's hear from George. Hey, Matt. Nicholas George down here in Georgia. Um, I actually have a intriguing question for you this week. Um, Marcus May, Jamal Adams, there's no doubt the two of them make up a really good safety combination. But I would not say it's the best in the NFL. And that, the main reason is because of Marcus May. I mean, let's be honest. He had some great plays last season, but he had some bad mistakes, too. I mean, there was a couple of touchdowns and catches that should not have been won, you know, as far as one-on-ones are concerned. So this is my question to you. What do you think about the Jets maybe drafting like a Grant Delpit or Xavier McKinney, um, both of them free safeties. You know, you could, you could pluck them in, and I feel like you could, you know, kind of forget about them. Once they're there, they're there. Boom, done. Don't have to worry about it no more. Um, maybe trade Marcus May somewhere. Maybe get like a third, second-round pick for him or something. Uh, that's my thoughts. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you so much for the question, George. And I'm going to disagree with you here. I think Marcus May is a very good safety. He was ranked 17th by Pro Football Focus for safeties. And that's not just for free safeties. It's safeties and free safeties combined. Uh, He was ranked 17th. And I think that he was pretty solid for the New York Jets this past year. He's a good running mate for Jamal Adams. And Xavier McKinney is going to be a first-round pick. I don't... If the Jets move back, I I wouldn't feel comfortable taking a safety. I really wouldn't. Grant L. Pitt, I not really all that high on. I think he's probably going to go in the second round. Um, you're kind of just creating another need if you do that. Wasting um, wasting is a tough word, but using a first or a second round pick on a position that is 
arguably the Jets' second best position. I would say the defensive line, just because the amount of bodies they have there, is their biggest strength. And then safety is their next one. Marcus May is good. He's not a top top safety in the league, but he is better. He's above average. He is definitely above average. He, he's not as good as what Jamal Adams is. There's no questioning that. But there's no guarantee that Xavier McKinney or um, – Grant Del Pitt is going to be as good as what Marcus May is. There's really no guarantee. And you're creating another hole because you could use one of those picks that you'd be using on one of those two guys, and you could draft a receiver or you could draft a tackle. And to me, it it, it wouldn't make sense to do that. I understand maybe if he does get beaten coverage at times, but overall I think he is an above-average player. So I wouldn't want to move on from Marcus May. I think he's very good. Uh, next up, we are going to go to Greg, who is calling about CJ Mosley. So let's hear a little bit from Greg. He's calling from upstate New York. Hey, man, what's going on? This is, uh, Greg from upstate New York, kind of around, uh, Newburgh area. Um, love what you're doing, man. I love the podcast stuff going on. Uh, you're very good with everything you're doing with, you know, details and on stats and everything. So, like, hopefully right now, you know, everyone's being safe. Hopefully you're safe right now. Um, but uh, I'm calling in to talk about C.J. Mosley. Now, the dude, obviously, is a beast. We signed him to, I know, a lot of money. I don't know really how much money, but I feel like no one's really talking about him, and it sucks because the guy, you know, as much of a big influence he could be, he was out for the entire season. You know, he comes in, he got hurt with a groin injury, and then, came back, I think, against New England for, like, half a game and then went back out because, I guess, he wasn't 100% healthy. Um, what's your details on him, and do you honestly think C.J. Mosley is going to be the same player he's he was supposed to be, honestly? Um, let me know how you think. Um, again, kind of sucks. We missed out on him, but I would think a groin injury, you know, for the entire year, I mean, that just seems like a big, big hit, you know what I mean? But uh, let me know, man. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. And the groin injuries are tough, especially for linebackers. Uh, I was surprised that he missed the pretty much the entire year. He came back very briefly against the Patriots, but didn't look the same at all. I think with a full offseason and resting it, I think is going to do him some wonders. I expect him to be pretty close to the same player that he's brought in here to be. And we saw his impact in the Buffalo game in week one. He was an absolute beast. Had a pick six. He was all over the field against Buffalo. He leaves and then they fall apart in the fourth quarter of that game. I think he's going to have a really big impact. Also, with C.J. Mosley, they all, they, the Jets also signed um, the, his running mate with the Ravens this past weekend, which was a minor depth move, but I think it was a pretty interesting one. And I think you could probably move on from Avery Williamson at that point and save the six six and a half million dollars in cap space because like you mentioned cj mosley is going to pay a ton of money he's getting like 17 million dollars a year against the cap that's a big cap number for an inside linebacker and if you could save a little bit of money and you know in in that that position by letting avery williamson go and addressing other areas i think that might be your best move here but for Mosley, I expect him to be someone who's going to rack up 90-plus tackles a year. He's going to be extremely solid. He's the leader of that defense outside of Jamal Adams. There was a reason why he was brought in here. Joe Douglas loves him. Adam Gase loves him. It, it just makes a ton of sense. It, it really does. And I know that Mike McCarthy technically signed him, but he's a Joe Douglas guy too. You could just tell by the way that you know, he, he is on the field. They say he's like another defensive coordinator out there when he's healthy and on the field. The, the Jets would be miles better with him on defense last year. They were 10th or 11th in the league in defensive DVOA. You add C.J. Mosley in, and that defense is probably somewhere between 5 and 7 with the, you know, corners that they had last year is extremely impressive. I, I think he makes a big difference for this team. I really do. This next one is from Ali calling from New York, and he has a question on Le'Veon Bell and Sam Darnold. So let's hear from Ali. Hey, Matt. It's Ali. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller. My question for you is um, we got a bunch of new acquisitions on the offensive line, and with that, uh, do you think this year with Le'Veon Bell coming back, do you think he rushes for over 1,000 yards? And do you think 
Sam Darnold throws for a franchise record. Uh, once again, um, Ali Lewis from upstate New York. Uh, love your show. Thanks. Thank you so much for calling in and for the question. So, with Le'Veon Bell, he was right around the 800 yards rushing last year. Obviously, a really down year for Bell. I fully expect him to be at 1,000 yards. I do. I really I don't love what the New York Jets have done to the offensive line. I like it. I think it's definitely an improvement. The interior, especially Van Roten on the right side, Alex Lewis, McGovern at center, Fant on likely the either the right or the left side, and then cross your fingers, the 11th overall pick on the left or the right side, depending on who they take. It's a much better offensive line, and I don't expect them to be as bad running the football as what they were. So I think it's fair to expect a 1,000 yards rushing from Le'Veon Bell. He's extremely talented. I think he could be in a 1,000-yard rusher. As for Sam Darnold, uh, Joe Namath has a record for passing yards, which is right over 4,000. It's like 4,007. And Ryan Fitzpatrick has the franchise record for touchdown passes in 31. So if Sam plays all 16 games, I think he has a chance for both of those. If I were to bet right now, I'm going to say probably around 3,800 yards for Sam Darnold if I had to pencil something in. Um, is it crazy that he could throw over for 4,000? No. For touchdowns, 31 seems pretty close to where I'd put him. I, th- I think it, at least to expect in the upper 20s, maybe low 30s. I think both numbers are... I mean, they're not phenomenal in terms of passing records for any franchise. But I could see Sam flirting with hitting those numbers. They're a little on the high side to expect for his first full 16-game season if he doesn't get hurt or mono. But I think, like I said, if I had to bet right now, I would take the under on both, but not by a lot. I don't think he's going to be coming in here and throwing for 3,200 yards and 20 touchdowns. I think you're going to be looking at like I said, maybe 38,000, uh, 38,000, that'd be something, 3,800 yards and 28 touchdowns. I think that's probably what you're looking at for Sam Darnold. Next question is from Henry. He is calling in from Georgia, and he wants to talk about the edge position. Hey, Matt, this is Henry from Georgia. I'm just calling because I have a question about the edge position. Uh, I feel like we could address that need by going the via trade route. And I was wondering if we were to pick Yannick, Yannick and Gakwe, what would be the right trade value for him as far as like trading away picks or players? Thank you. Go Jets. I love Yannick and Gakwe. There is no questioning that. I would love to have him on my team, but it's going to take so much to get him. I think some team is going to give up a first-round pick in order to get him. I really do. And I wouldn't give up 11 overall. I think that's asking too much. But I definitely could see a team at the back half of the first round give up a pick in order to get him. Maybe like the Vikings. I don't know what their cap situation's like. I'm just thinking of a team who has multiple first-rounders who could look to address that position. Maybe the Dolphins. That could be interesting. They have three first-round picks. Maybe a move the last one. Uh, for Yannick and Gakwe, I think I would rather take a swing at Everson Griffin or Clay Matthews or Vinnie Curry on like a one-year deal who could just be a stopgap and give you eight to ten sacks, somewhere in that range, to pair with Jordan Jenkins on the other side. I think that would make the most sense for right now. I, I don't I can't see the Jets in a position where they could give up the 11th overall pick for a player. I don't. I think they have too many other needs. Um, I would still go wide receiver or offensive tackle in the first round and then whichever one you don't take in the second. So my ideal plan would be um, offensive tackle in the first, whether it's I would, I'm going to assume Andrew Thomas would be the pick. Um, and then in the second round, the receiver. I think that's the way to go. Maybe you take a mid-round edge rusher I'd be okay with that and seeing how they do pairing him with a a veteran like Everson Griffin and going from there so uh yeah I wouldn't be opposed to that but I I don't think I would give up a first or a second round pick in a trade for an edge rusher that's just me this next one is from Mac I think it's hard to tell buddy so if I get this one wrong I uh I apologize um but I, I believe it's Mac let's hear from him 
Hi, Matt O'Leary. This is Mac Rocha. I live in Hampton, New Jersey. And I have a question about, do you think Rashard Perryman is the answer? Because I think he's a fast, over-the-top receiver, but can he run over the middle, take a hit? I know Robbie couldn't really. Well, he could, but to a point. And um, I just wanted to know your opinion on it. Um, of course, you made a video on it, which I watched, but, you know. And do you want Jadavion Clowney? I saw that video as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to draft C.D. Lamb because we have built so much, you know, Joe Douglas put a lot into this offensive line this off season, but let me know which receiver, if we were to pick one in the first round, would you like the most? Okay, I really like this question a lot, and thank you so much, man, for calling in. Appreciate it. Um, as far as it goes with Perriman, we'll start there. I think he can go over the middle because he's a little bit bigger than Robbie. He's 6'2", and I think 215, so he's got about 25 pounds on Robbie Anderson. He is extremely fast. He is someone who is more likely to take the top off of a defense, but I wouldn't be nervous about him taking a hit or anything like that. I, I think he could take a hit for sure. I think he's good. I don't think he's as good as what Robbie is. I've expressed that a lot on this show so far. I, I think he is a solid plan B after you swung and missed on Robbie or didn't even take a swing really realistically. Um, I would have preferred to bring Robbie Anderson back, but after he was gone, Perryman was my number one choice on the market, so it, it makes sense. Uh, yes, just to reiterate, I don't want any part of J.D. Ivan Clowney. I think he is extremely overrated. He is looking to get $17-plus plus million a year. He is someone who has never eclipsed nine and a half sacks. He's never hit double digits in sacks, so I, I can't justify giving someone $17 million who has never hit double-digit sacks. I know he's good at, in, in the run, and he draws double teams, and these are the same things we heard about Leonard Williams. Granted, he's a much better player than Leonard Williams. I just don't think he's worth the money that he's asking. He's a headache. He's a penalty machine. I would avoid him at all costs. And if I had my choice at the receiver, I like C.D. Lamb a lot. I would not be opposed to picking him. I think Judy's the best. He is a really, really good route runner. Jerry Judy's a phenomenal route runner. Going to get into this in the next question a little bit more. Uh, we have an anonymous caller up next who wants to talk Jerry Judy. But um, for CeeDee Lamb, he gets a lot of comparisons to DeAndre Hopkins, so I would not be opposed to taking a player like that either. I still think the pick's going to be offensive line. I still think they need a tackle, and I think that's going to be the pick, and they'll go receiver in round two. So let's talk a little bit more Jerry Judy. And uh, this anonymous caller is really high on him. Hey, Matt O'Leary, what's going on? Um, I'm a big fan. I watch all your videos. Um, and I've been, like, constantly invested in who the Jets are going to draft. Um, and I've been falling in love with Jerry Judy. Can I just pause this for a second? I, I love that he said he's been falling in love with the idea of who the Jets could draft. It's sad because I relate to that so much. The Jets are basically out of it by November. So from, like, November on, I'm just looking at draft mock drafts and draft profiles. It's really sad, but I, that just hit struck a chord with me. So I 100% agree. Sorry to cut you off. Let's get back to Jerry Judy. All right. And I think that we could become a Super Bowl-capable team with him and as well as we could either trade for a couple offensive tackles later on in the draft um, and still get some really good defensive players in the second, third, fourth round. Um, some time in there, but I was wondering if you could talk about like Jared Judy, um, and your thoughts around us taking him over like a lineman, and like what scenario we would take him, and um, what do you think the Jets are thinking about, um, like what's their strategy for the eleventh pick, um, that. Uh, keep making, keep doing your thing. Keep making great vids. Uh, go Jets. Thank you so much for the question. So, okay, let me answer it like this. If the New York Jets decided to go wide receiver in the first round, and again, I would be very surprised if Joe Douglas did that. I think their plan is to take the best offensive lineman available when they're picking, but I'm going to operate under this assumption. Jerry Judy and CeeDee Lamb are both there. I would prefer Judy would not be opposed to Lamb. Judy, I think, is just a phenomenal route runner. He is, has the higher ceiling, I think, 
Or maybe I think the higher floor. The floor might be higher with him, which I think maybe the better way to describe it because DeAndre Hopkins, I mean, just phenomenal. But anyway, um, if the New York Jets were to take Jerry Judy at 11th overall, I think you then have to take one of your third round picks and trade for Trent Williams, which is a little bit risky because he didn't play at all last year. But when he does play, he's a top five to 10 tackle in this league. I know he's over 30 years old. Tackles can play a lot longer now. It's a little outside the box in terms of roster building. Usually you want to take young offensive linemen and have them for a very long time. Trading for one seems like a little bit risky, especially for someone who hasn't played. But if you're only giving up a third round pick to do it, I think what you would have to do in order to convince Joe Douglas to take a wide receiver in round one would be to trade a third round pick for Trent Williams. And then from there, you can draft whoever you want in the first round, really. And then you don't have if you go wide receiver in round one, you don't have to go worry about going offensive line in round two. Maybe you could take a corner because I still think that's a big pos- uh, position of need. Um, so other positions I'd like to see them take a swing on on the defensive side of the ball is edge. Realistically, the only two positions I care about right now for this New York Jets team uh, for looking to add uh, on the defensive side of the ball is edge and corner. I think those are two positions where the Jets don't have a ton of depth. They have a lot on the interior defensive line. Inside linebacker, they have so much depth. Safety, they have a good amount of depth that. So edge and corner is definitely positions of need on the defense. And then other than that, maybe you take a swing on a mid-round interior offensive lineman. I'd be cool with that. Maybe if you're trading uh, for Trent Williams, you could use a, a pick for an offensive tackle later. But I think that would be the only way that they take a wide receiver in round one is if you are trading your third round pick for Trent Williams. All right, next up on this list is Vinny in Connecticut. Wants to talk about winning and when there's finally going to be a winning mandate for this team. Hey, Matt, Vinny in Connecticut calling once again. My question to you is, where do you think the franchise stands in terms of drawing the line in the sand and saying that wins finally matter? Um, I know the ownership says that there never will be a playoff mandate, but at some point, wins have to matter. And I highly doubt 7-9 and nine or 8-8 eight and eight is going to be acceptable once again for this franchise. So my question, I guess, is what number do you think that Adam Gaze has to hit at the end of the season, playoffs or not, to save his job? And secondly, two-part question, if he is gone, God willing, because <laughs> I, like you. you and many other Jets fans, can't stand this guy, who do you think would be a good candidate to come in here and be a real head coach and not a bottom three guy like this guy? Let me know. Take care and uh, stay safe. Love the question. Thank you so much. So let's get to the first part first. I think there should be a playoff mandate. I know that ownership said they aren't going to do it, but this is going to be Adam Gase's fifth year coaching in the AFC East. The excuses should be gone. He has his own, he handpicked his GM, who I happen to like. I have a lot of faith in Joe Douglas. I have no faith in the head coach, though. The offensive line is there. The quarterback is there. You could add in the draft at wide receiver. There is no more excuses. I can't stand the excuses when it comes to Adam Gase. I am tired of it. He has to. I think he's got to get to nine wins. I do. I don't think seven. If they go seven and nine again, you you can't bring him back. Eight and eight. You're not making the playoffs at eight and eight. Even if they add the seventh team, the wild card. There's too many teams in the AFC that are good. You're not going to get in at 8-8 eight and eight as a wild card. I think you got to hit 9. But with the Jets' schedule this upcoming year, it's going to be very tough for them to hit 9 wins. One of the things, though, that you can convince me on the Jets actually being the same record and then bringing them back is with the schedule. So they're playing the NFC North, uh, the NFC West, excuse me, which I think is the best coach division in football. I mean, from top to bottom. You have Pete Carroll, Cliff Kingsbury I love. Sean McVay, I love, and obviously um, Kyle Shanahan, I think he's a very good coach. So those are four really good coaches in my eyes. That's not going to be easy. Maybe best case scenario, go two and two against that division. Then the AFC West, that's going to be tough because you're going to do a lot of traveling. Kansas City, that's a very tough place to play, Super Bowl champions. Denver is a really, really improved team. They're they are doing a lot for Drew Locke. I like that team a lot. They're heading in the right direction. The Chargers are going to be a tough team to play. And the Raiders, they're never easy to play. And the Jets, as we know, they stink traveling to the West Coast. So that's going to be very difficult. I think you're going to go 7-9, and 6-10, and 10, something like that. So I, 
I can't hit them. I can't see them hitting that nine wins. I would like to be proven wrong. I I pray the New York Jets make the playoffs. I want them to, but just looking at this team logically, I don't see how they do it. I don't with the schedule and the whole. Still, I don't. Last questions from John in Miami. He wants to talk a little uh, Chuma Doga. Hey Matt, uh, this is John calling from Miami. Um, hopefully you're safe up there and um, you know, taking this uh, quarantine thing kind of seriously. But uh, my question and my general thought um, is: I know you can't stand the guy right now from last year, but Chuma Doga. I understand we had drafted him in the third round. He was 21 years old when he got drafted. He played in the season as a 22-year-old going against grown-ass men. He had eight games. He did okay, you know. And I know they made a lot of improvements on the offensive line. And, you know, the Jets, you know, are pretty highly, high, really high regard on him. And I think the reason why is because he's so young that they have a lot of time to develop him. And Joe does this, it's, you know, that's his forte. Um, I think... You were right when you say he's a backup right now, but I think he needs to learn multiple positions. I think he needs to learn how to play guard as well. And I think he needs every opportunity to compete with George Font, uh, to see if he can possibly be the starter. Or if he's not, he better play a lot of positions on the offensive line so he can get some work done. Maybe some sub packages where they need extra linemen. Cause he's a, he needs to know every position, I think. Uh, an offensive line to bring his value up. He still needs to grow. He's 23 years old. He still needs his body to mature, get stronger, get more athletic. But uh, what is your take on him? I know you you don't really care for the guy right now, but I do see uh, him to develop into a really good starter in the future because we got a lot of one-year deals basically on his dad's contract. So I think um, he's going to give him a chance, man. Stop being so, uh, so mean to the kid. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye. <laughs> I love it. Okay, I was, I'm sorry for being mean. I just, I don't, I, I don't like what I've seen so far about Drew Madoka. And again, I hope he proves me wrong. I hope he comes in, competes with Fant, and beats him out. Because I would love for a mid-round pick to turn into a quality starter. I just haven't seen it enough from Mike McCagnan, guys. I haven't. Right now, I think he projects as a backup tackle. Like, your sixth offensive lineman. So, yeah, I could see him in... You know, as a spot starter or someone who could come in, I, I think he can play on the right side eventually. I, I don't trust him as a left tackle, but maybe he could be if Fant's on a one-year deal, pretty much. So I could see them moving on from him after one year and then just having uh, a Doga at right tackle. And you brought up a good point. The Jets are really high on him. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if him and Fant are battling it out for the right tackle position. It really wouldn't. And I, I do think they're going to draft someone in, in the first round to play on the other side, and it's going to be between those two. I, if I were betting, I would think Fant is probably better, but I, I like that optimist, the optimistic approach. He is young. You bring up a great point. He is extremely young. Maybe he develops. Maybe he does, but I don't think he's ready yet. I think if you sit him on the bench and have him as your sixth guy, he comes in in certain packages, like you said, and if someone, God forbid, gets hurt, he comes in. Okay, I could live with that. And then reevaluate going into 2021. But as of now, I think you're in bad shape if he's a starting offensive lineman. Thank you so much for all the questions this week. I know I went question heavy, but you guys really killed it. And I had a lot of fun doing it, so thank you so much for calling in and leaving your voicemails. I'm going to be back again on Monday for Episode 8. These things are flying by, so thank you so much for tuning in. I am Matt O'Leary. I'll talk to you next time.